Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. You are joining us for the first educational webinar for the LaSalle Street Reimagined SPIF program. We'll get started in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the LaSalle Street Reimagined SPIF rollout webinar. This is going to be the first in a series of three that we'll be doing, uh, talking about this program that opens in September. Uh, for everybody joining today, you will receive a follow-up email with a copy of the presentation. Additionally, you can re-watch it again on the DPD's YouTube page. Um, we also just want to make sure everyone here, if you have questions during the presentation, you can use the Q&A box on your screen and answer. we'll answer those either behind the scenes or actually have a Q&A session at the end. So we'll get started in just a moment. All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kim Brisky and I am the Director of Communications at Summer Corps. We're the administrator of the SPIF program on behalf of the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the LaSalle Street Reimagined SPIF program. And uh, to get things started, I'm gonna turn it over to Nora Curry at DPD for some opening remarks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kimberly. As Kim said, my name is Nora Curry. I am the SPIF Program Director for the Department of Planning and Development at the City of Chicago. And uh, very briefly, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are thrilled to be able to offer the Small Business Improvement Fund within the LaSalle Street Corridor. Um, we are happy to have you with us today to begin talking about it. And um, I do want to let you know, hopefully you all are aware of our open house and reception next week on Wednesday, June 7th. Um, on the South Street, we will be hosting, along with Robots in Chicago, DPD and Summer Corps together, we'll be hosting um, an opportunity for uh, interested people to come and look at about 10 different properties on the South Street that have available property. Um, we will have an open house and tour from about two o'clock to four o'clock. You can have the opportunity to walk around. We'll send out maps of available properties. And then we'll have a reception where people can speak to each other, potential tenants to potential uh, landlords, and get to know each other and see if you have a match. Um, you can register. Kim has the information at the end of this she, you can also, after at the end of her presentation, you can also go to our website at chicago.gov slash LaSalle Street and register there for the open house and reception. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nora. So again, uh, just a reminder for everybody, this uh, presentation today is focused on the LaSalle Street Reimagined SPIF program. That is actually not opening for new applications until September. So don't send anything today uh, if, after you hear the presentation. But um, our goal is to just make sure, because this is something new, that we give all of our small business applicants as much time as possible to be prepared. If you are interested in the regular SPIF program, which we have monthly presentations and rollouts for, specifically for those districts that are opening in June, we're going to have our standard webinar uh, next Wednesday as well. And um, we actually will always post those uh, links to register for those at chicago.gov slash SPIF. You can find those there. Anybody participating today will receive a copy of this presentation via email afterwards. And feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box box at the top of your screen. All right, let's get started. So today we're going to cover the following. 
First, just a quick rundown of what LaSalle Street Reimagined is. We'll talk about the basics of the SPIF program and specifically a little bit about how the LaSalle Street Reimagined SPIF area is going to work. Next, we'll cover some typical SPIF program FAQs and then some of the key dates uh, and next steps if you are interested in participating in the LaSalle Street Reimagined. And then we'll close out with a Q&A featuring the uh, director of the SPIF program at Summer Corps, Silvia Orozco. So the first question is, what is LaSalle Street Reimagined? Uh, my guess is you've heard quite a bit about this actually in the news in that uh, the city of Chicago is really working to try to revitalize this uh, downtown corridor in the loop. And uh, earlier this spring, there actually were three uh, actual buildings in the loop that are going to be reused and turned into mixed um, income housing units with city financial assistance. And as part of that initiative to really support those buildings on the ground level, the city of Chicago is investing $5 million in SPIF along that area of LaSalle. In terms of what actually is SPIF, it's been launched uh, in 1999 and Summer Corps the entire time has been the administrator of this program. And it's an economic development program that provides small businesses and property owners with reimbursement grants to make permanent building improvements. Uh, residential projects are not eligible. The SPIF grant uses TIF financing to reimburse grantees for their pre-approved projects. Specifically for the LaSalle reimagined TIF area, we have the map up here on the screen. And the first step to determine whether or not you're actually eligible to participate is geography. You can see here the bold lines of what buildings are eligible to participate in the SPIF grant program. If you're um, wondering if your property or the space you're looking at is eligible, you can use the SPIF locator tool, which we'll go into on the next slide. Please note that those other buildings that I mentioned earlier that are already receiving uh, other assistance through the LaSalle Street Reimagine initiative are not eligible to receive SPIF grant funding. So if you're interested to find out if the property you are looking at is in the LaSalle Street TIF district, or honestly, in any TIF district, visit summercore.com slash SPIF and click on option one. This will take you to the SPIF locator tool. There you put in your address. For the purposes of this demonstration, that's actually the Summer Corps office, which is at 209 South LaSalle in the Rookery building. If you put that in there, you'll see that it actually is eligible on the LaSalle Street TIF, and it is opening September of 2023, and the Chicago Loop Alliance is the delegate agency available to assist. I think the most important questions come to um, about the grant parameters are who is eligible to actually participate. Similar to the regular SPIF program, landlords can apply property owners or owner operators, business owners that are tenants, and startups. With these key um, caveats here is that for landlords, they need to be prepared with the lease, uh, an actual tenant lease when the project is complete. For a business owner who's also a tenant, they also need to have approval from the property owner and a startup must apply with a business plan and have the Chicago business license. But here's the key point on this uh, participating in the SPIF program, is that the applicant that you list on the application must either be the property owner or the lessee. And that is the person that is responsible for the management of the grant. The listed applicant is responsible for communicating with Summer Corps, for paying for the work, submitting all the paperwork, and will be reimbursed, reimbursed when the project is complete. Applications cannot be submitted, managed, on the other entity's behalf. Applicants may not operate as their own general contractor. So again, just in summary, that if you are the one that's applying, you are the one who will be responsible for all of the uh, par parts of the program and be able to actually receive reimbursement. When we're talking about the grant parameters, the next question is how much in a grant financing are you able to receive? For a commercial single tenant property, it's the maximum is 250,000 per applicant. In the case of a commercial multi-tenant property, it's $250,000 maximum per applicant, a million maximum for the property. Additionally, 
And another $50,000 is available for business applicants that are expanding from a low to moderate income neighborhood. More information on that on the next slide. All applicants are eligible to be reimbursed for 90% of their total eligible project costs up to the grant maximum. So let's walk through this a little further. First, in regards to the extra $50,000 for businesses that are expanding from uh, low to moderate incomes communities, here is a map that we can also um, make sure that you have access to. It will be included in the presentation you receive. And this outlines all of the areas um, and communities that will be eligible for the additional $50,000. So let's go through a grant calculation. Let's say that Grace is submitting an application for a SPIF grant to open a second location of her restaurant on the LaSalle Street Reimagined Corridor. Her original restaurant is located in Armour Square. She has a lease agreement for her new property in the LaSalle Street SPIF area. The application has a total eligible project cost of $330,000. So let's walk through the calculation. If the total eligible project cost is $330,000, her maximum SPIF grant size is the $250,000, which is the base maximum for any of these commercial single tenant buildings, plus $50,000 for being from an LMI area. That means that her maximum grant size is $300,000. Her, the city responsibility is 90% of the total eligible costs, 297,000. That leaves the remaining 10% of applicant responsibility at 33,000. As a reminder, the SPIF program is a reimbursement grant. So project participants should be prepared with financing to support the permanent billing improvements up front. So now we know sort of uh, the types of applicants that can apply. We know how much the financing can be for, but the next question is what type of businesses are eligible? When we're looking at those who cannot apply, we're talking about chains, franchise restaurants, liquor stores, nightclubs, adult use, places of worship, gas stations, things like that. This list is not comprehensive, though, so if you're unsure, uh, feel free to reach out to Summer Corps, and we're happy to review your uh, business type. The next question is, how can you use these grant funds? The goal is to use them for permanent interior or exterior improvements on the ground floor or great hall levels of buildings. Let's a couple of examples would be storefront and facade improvements, permanent interior renovation work, including fixtures, plumbing and electrical, alterations or structures for ADA compliance, certain architectural and construction management fees related to the SPIF approved project. Again, this list is not comprehensive, and we encourage you, if you have questions about the type of work you'd like to do for your project and you're not sure if it's eligible, reach out to Summer Corps and we're happy to help. What kind of uh, improvement costs are ineligible for SPIF funding? This would be anything that's new construction, like additions, expansions, or ground up construction, any standalone minor repairs or cosmetic improvements, equipment related expenses, uh, planters, outdoor dining or dining areas like roof deck, beer gardens, outdoor patios, fencing, parking lot construction or repair, landscaping, or any work on the interior of residential units. Again, this list is not comprehensive. And please note that property zoning may have additional restrictions. This is something that we uh, specifically may have to address with the LaSalle Street Corridor. We kind of dig into that here. Uh, what are the design requirements? Please note that all SPIF projects that are part of the LaSalle Reimagine Initiative will be reviewed by the Department of Planning and Development's Planning Division. In addition, all SPIF projects part of the initiative are subject to existing design requirements. This includes designated Chicago landmark buildings must comply with landmark ordinance and any rules and regulations of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. Buildings that are not designed or excuse me, not designated as Chicago landmarks, but are orange rated in the Chicago Historic Resources Survey um, will have their um, review all permit applications by, by the Historic Preservation uh, 
division as pursuant to the demolition delay ordinance. That's a lot of language, but to say this, you can use this map that's actually on the Chicago uh, city of Chicago zoning map to be able to see if the space that you're looking at has to actually comply with any of these additional design requirements. If that's the case and you have some questions, feel free to reach out to uh, Summer Corps or DPD and we'll make sure we get you the information that you need. As we're thinking about the SPIF program and, and specifically for the LaSalle Street Corridor pilot program, here are a couple of additional FAQs that should help you be prepared for applying in September. First question would be, what additional documents do you have on hand to submit along with your SPIF application? In September, you only need to apply with the three-page application that's pretty simple. But quickly afterwards, you will be asked by your Summer Corps project manager for additional information. That's going to include items like your tax return, proof of property ownership, or your lease, um, if it's a startup for a business plan and projected incomes and expenses, items like this. So it's not required on the initial application form, but they a lot of them will be required not too far down the road. And in order to keep your project moving and on schedule, I encourage you to start collecting these documents now. Another question we'll, we'll often get are what are the financial requirements to participate in the SPIF program? It's important to note that the SPIF program is a reimbursement grant. So project participants should be prepared with financing to support the permanent building improvements up front. While proof of financing is now required until stage three in the process, applicants are encouraged to contact their business lender or reach out to one of the lenders listed on the Summer Corps website in a timely manner to be prepared when it is time to provide the proof of financing. We do have an option for grantees to actually complete their work in phases rather than requiring 100% of upfront costs of the project. Uh, applicants will receive approval for the full scope of work and constructions will actually be completed in phases based on contractor recommendations and necessity. The phase disbursements will be based on progress or completion of the work. As an example, let's say an applicant was approved for a roof tear off, HVAC system, and installation of a new storefront under one application. Once the roof is done, then they can submit the paperwork and be reimbursed for that, and then address the HVAC, and then repeat the process for the storefront upgrades. If you are going to participate in the phase process, please be sure that you have uh, a full discussion with your Summer Core project management manager first, and that it's all spelled out so we're all on the same page. Are startups or new businesses eligible? Yes, they are. Um, you can apply, but you will again need to have your business plan and projections of the income and expenses for the first 36 months in operations. Um, and I think it's important to note that this, uh, we're not having any um, startup bars, taverns, or hotels that any of those applicants must have already had their license and been in business for more than one calendar year. Will there be enough SPIF for all applicants? This is a great question. And in every case, when we're doing a SPIF um, rollout, it really is based on um, how much money is actually available. And if the demand for the SPIF funds is greater for those than those that actually, uh, excuse me, if the, if, the, if the demand is higher than we actually have, a lottery will be conducted to determine the order in which each grant application will be accommodated. Uh, this is not a competitive grant. This is a, a grant where anybody is actually able to apply, and if they meet the standards, they will be able to participate. In the case of LaSalle Reimagined, we have $5 million in grant dollars available for this particular rollout. If you think that this sounds like a program that would work for you, the next question is, how do I apply? You can go to summercore.com slash SPIF to download the application. You can see it here on the screen. And again, this is the, the, the simple three-page application that let, lets us know that you're interested in participating. And as long as you email it to SPIF at summercore.com within the designated open period, we will accept your application. And to be clear, the acceptance period is between 9 a.m. on Friday, September 1st and 5 p.m. on Monday, October 2nd. Please do not send any applications before 
Friday, September 1st, they will not be accepted. And any applications received after 5 p.m. on Monday, October 2nd will not be accepted. Uh, for all of our purposes, just to make sure everything is time stamped, we, we ask you to first allow two business days for Summer Corps to complete, uh, to confirm rece receipt of your application. But if you don't receive a confirmation, please send us another email or give us a call to uh, make sure that we have it on hand. Applicants are responsible for making sure their submissions are received within the open acceptance period. For those of you who are new to the SPIF program, here is a projected SPIF timeline if everything um, is moving exactly along uh, the, the time windows. We have first, you'll actually have your application date. And during that time, we'll, afterwards, we will start the application eligibility review period. That's going to be up to 20 days, and that's when we ask for those additional documents that I discussed earlier, and tenant applicants prove site control. After that point, you'll actually be in the project eligibility review phase. That's going to be up to 120 days where the applicant is able to get their plans, bids, and specs, and if you have any debt with the city, that's going to be scoff law, outstanding water bills, things like that. You will have up to 120 days to cure those debts, either by paying them or by setting up a payment plan with the city. Stage three is going to be project construction. Uh, after you actually receive your commitment letter from the city of Chicago, you actually are eligible to start your construction. Don't start construction before you receive your conditional commitment letter uh, or you will be unable to be reimbursed. So you have up to 10 months to complete the construction on your project. 120 days into that 10 months, you will have to provide both your proof of financing as well as proof of permit uh, submission. Lastly, once your project is complete and Summer Corps receives all of your paperwork and has done a final site visit, you will receive your reimbursement check within four to six weeks. If you're wondering what resources are available, we have quite a few that you are able to take advantage of. Again, at summercore.com slash SPIF, here are some key resources that you can use to support your SPIF project. That's going to be things like basic design guidelines, a list of lenders who have previously worked on SPIF projects, a list of contractors that have previously worked on SPIF projects, and other technical assistance providers. Additionally, for the specific SPIF, uh, the LaSalle SPIF, we have some key partners that are able to assist. The Chicago Loop Alliance is the designated delegate agency for this um, application process, and they're a great place to start if you need assistance with your application. If you're trying to find a commercial space, feel free to reach out to World Business Chicago. I also encourage you to attend our uh, open house walking tour and reception on June 7th. And if you have other questions just about the SPIF program, you can reach out to us at Summer Corps or to Nora at DPD. Most importantly, um, again, this will be sent to you via email, but just so you have sort of the timeline going forward is that we will um, be very shortly having the real estate inventory on a website so that you can view that there. However, we encourage you to view it in person on June 7th with the registration link here. We're also going to have this webinar reproduced on June 27th and August 29th. So if you have additional questions after viewing the property, you're welcome to come and join us again. Or if you have any other friends and business owners who you think would be a good fit, invite them to participate. And then, of course, the big date, September 1, is when the application period opens for the LaSalle Reimagined SPIF area. So at this time, I am going to pause and just remind everyone, if you have any questions about this program, about SPIF in general, about LaSalle Reimagined, feel free to put them now in the Q&A box on the screen. Uh, additionally, you will be receiving a copy of this presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop on here with my camera and I'm going to invite um, Sylvia to also turn her camera on and I can introduce Sylvia, who is the program manager for SPIF at Summer Corps. She has been running this, the SPIF program for, I think, over 17 years now. So if you have questions about how the program works, she is such a great resource. Um, 
Sylvia, I did want to start off with one question, which was, we know that the city of Chicago has a lot of programs right now out there to support small businesses. Can you talk about if either the NOF grant, the SPIF grant, the Chicago Recovery Plan, how can they all work together uh, for any small businesses interested in applying? Sure. Thank you, Kim. Um, so what happens is, you know, if someone's interested in, in applying for SPIF and other programs as well, unfortunately, they cannot combine the programs at the same time. SPIF does have the most restrictions based off of, you know, the ordinances compared to the NOF and also Chicago Recovery Plan. You can apply for all programs. NOF is geographically based as well, so keep that in mind, um, but you can apply for the programs, but you cannot utilize both programs at the same time. Ultimately, what has to be done is you have to basically look into the program, see which one works best for you, and decide which program to pursue. That's great. I was going to say, would you mind digging a little bit further in about the conditional commitment letter, what sort of happens up to that point, and then what that means you can do going forward? I sort of glossed over that a section a little bit. Sure. So what happens is, you know, once you submit your application, you want to put in your wish list realistically, you know, what your plan is, what needs to be done. Um, if you are thinking, you know, maybe my HVAC system needs to, you know, be replaced in a few years, add that to your application. So once you start gathering your contractor's estimates, um, we, we actually go by your approval based on the estimates from your contractors based off of their scope of work and their contract price. There's also a contingency depending on whether or not you're maxed out on the program. Contingency is included for cost overruns. Um, so basically you have to know exactly what you need to have done, have your contractor's estimates, your conditional commitment will be based on those items only. So if you are not approved for something, um, if there's unforeseen issues as construction is going on, you know, notify your app, your project manager right away and let them know if any changes need to be made. They need to be presented to us. We need to present it to DPD to make any changes if required, whether it's based on the approved scope of work or if it is based on an increased cost. We can increase your grant amounts if there's funding available, but it's very important that you know, you follow the guidelines, you communicate with your project manager to let them know what's going on so that we can help you transition, you know, from start to finish. That's really helpful. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here. Um, let's see if I have the map. Uh, uh, here's the actual, this is a better map actually. So I've had a couple of questions here about, well, what if, um, what if uh, I'm looking at a particular property? First of all, the first question is, how are we able to see which buildings would be a good fit? Again, I encourage you come on June 7th for the walking tour. I know somebody said, oh, we're not available on those days and that's okay. While you may not be able to participate in the big walking tour, um, we will, again, in pretty short order, have the list of properties of folks that, are just, that gave us their information and are posting it on the city of Chicago's website. But additionally, you do not are not necessarily limited to those properties that purposefully came to us and gave us their address and said we want to to be there. If the pro property you're looking at is actually on the corridor that I have showing here, you are eligible to apply uh, for that property. So it does not necessarily have to be one that's on the list. The one we're just trying to be able to bring as many people in um, as possible. Um, so I just want to make sure again, uh, come on June 7th if you can, and if you cannot, that's okay. Um, really just the key about whether or not your property is going to be eligible. The first step is going to be double checking the address to make sure it is in the LaSalle reimagined corridor. Uh, Nora, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on that point? I don't think so. Awesome. Oh, yes. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Um, I was just going to say, um, as I, I responded to the person who asked about being out of town, um, we will be putting the um, the listings of the folks who are sharing the um, at the who are giving tours at the open house next week. We will be putting that listing and the map online, and um, so if you miss it or if you 
do go and you don't catch people's contact information or anything like that, you'll be able to go to our website, find their information and reach out to them on your own and set up your own meeting with them, talk to them on the phone and see if um, you can make a deal. We do expect that this is not gonna be the only time that um, people make these connections. There are pro there may be other properties that people are interested in that are available, but they didn't uh, participate in this event. And in fact, we do know there is another property available that they're gonna be on the website, but they're not participating in the open house. So um, there are gonna be situations like that. So we definitely encourage you to do your own outreach, do your own research and uh, work with folks. You're, you're not gonna do everything that you need to do in this event. It's just an opportunity for people to um, to start the process to get out and it's sort of a matchmaking. It's sort of a one of the a fast date. What did they use to call those things? Speed dating. dating. <laughs> Speed dating. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of that to to get some energy up and bring people together. But it's it's not at all like you have to attend this event or you're never going to make a deal here. Not at all that. No. And honestly, that's why we're talking about this in June for something that opens in September um, mm -hmm. to try to encourage folks to take the opportunity to look. Um, and sort of on this line, Sylvia, is we had a question about, so, uh, you know, how does it work with leasing the building and then actually doing the project? Like, are you actually already paying rent while you're there? I know that everything is always subject a little bit specifically to your actual lease, but can you talk about site control and how that plays into SPIF? Sure. So you do have to have site control at the time of application, basically, because time really flies by. Um, so once you have that open acceptance period, after the open acceptance period, what happens is, you know, we'll send out a letter to the applicants and you know, request site control. So they are granted 20 days to submit either the proof of ownership if they own the property or to submit an executed lease agreement. So they do have to have site control in order for us to move forward. We do not keep an application active if they don't have site control. We do not provide conditional approvals for those that do not have site control either. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through here, uh, looking through the content here. Oh, another question is, so when you're actually applying, do you need to upload renderings or drawings on your application? Or at what point would you actually need to provide those? So after the initial stage of completing the application, if your business is deemed eligible to move forward, you will enter the second stage as we refer to it, which is the planning phase. So within this planning phase, you'll be granted 120 days to submit any architectural drawings, um, any renderings for signage, facade changes, things of that sort, along with at least two competitive estimates. Their contractors do have to have City of Chicago business licenses and certificates of insurance. I always encourage people to definitely reach out to more than two contractors. You definitely get the feel for, you know, how responsive they are, their knowledge, see the difference in pricing. You know, we want to make sure that you get the best deal for your money um, moving forward from there. Great. Uh, a specific question about multi-tenant applications. Does the building need to have separate pins or different addresses, or can everyone just, you know, using that same address apply? How does that work? So you can submit an application for multi-tenant properties. Usually they are distinguished by a suite number. Um, so that's how we would distinguish each space. You know, if we get multiple applications for one property, you know, we'd have to communicate with the applicants and understand exactly where their space of occupancy will be. Okay. I have somebody here who actually is super excited to move in on the LaSalle Street corridor. They're actually getting ready to sign a lease very shortly, but are they allowed to start their construction now before applying on September 1 and then be reimbursed by the program? Unfortunately not. If you can hold off, I would say hold off. If you want to be reimbursed through this program, hold off. Otherwise, anything that is paid for or any construction that has begun before you receive your conditional commitment letter will not be eligible for reimbursement. Yeah, and just as a reminder on that timeline, 
the conditional commitment letter is after the Oakland application period ends on October 2nd, then the applications are reviewed and then you actually are moved and your actual specific bids and everything's are reviewed and then you'll get the commitment letter. So there, if you're able to hold on, please do. And the faster and the more uh, you have your documentation together, Sylvia, that will really help you move through the program faster to be able to get things started. So, um, right. So I think, let's see. So we had a question specifically about, um, so once you actually receive your commitment letter, does that mean that that is the amount of funding that you'll be able to grant funding that you'll be reimbursed for? Could there be other things like more people wanting to apply that impact your grant amount once you receive the conditional commitment letter? So once you receive a conditional commitment letter, your funding is tied to your project. So that's a commitment from the city. As long as you abide by the program rules, guidelines, and things of that sort, that money is specifically reserved for your project. So if you're able to get funding, you know, great. Um, you know, as long as you abide by the rules, we will hold that money. So we won't, you know, have someone else grab those funds that are already reserved. That's very helpful. Um, I think I think somebody was asking, so like, how could could funds actually run out? And I think I, I covered earlier um, that that it's five million dollars is actually set aside for this rollout, which I don't know if we've ever done one that's that that big. Nor you probably know historically better than me. Um, but you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of um, you know, do we you know how the support for the program could impact, um, you know, going forward if we do really have a very popular interest uh, in this application period. Sure, so if we do have a very popular interest and the request for funding exceeds $5 million, we will conduct a lottery. It will be live, applicants will be invited to view it. We basically do a randomized draw process. Each application that is received will be part of this draw. And it's basically on an Excel sheet. It automatically randomizes um, the applications and that is the order in which the applications are processed. So those will be processed based on their estimated cost until we don't have any funding available. So at that point, there's a project that may be either underfunded or applications may be placed on the wait list. That wait list will be active for 24 months. If someone doesn't qualify, if someone doesn't meet their deadlines, happens to be removed, that money goes back into the pot and we go down the draw order list in the order that it was drawn. All right, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, Nora, is there anything um, that you wanted to add or talk about? Yeah, I would like to, there was somebody who asked about um, what buildings were available or, you know, where the area where it was available. I know you talked about the eligible area. I did want to share if I can. Oh, yeah. The, do you need me to stop share perhaps? Uh, let me see if I can do it. Oh, goodness. My Zoom skills after using the other system. <laughs> Our, I'll stop. I'm going to stop share for one second. Oh, share screen. There we go. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to pull up. Oh my goodness, something is happening with my screen. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness, what is happening with my screen? Oh dear. Sorry, everybody. I may not be able to show this. Do you want to try double clicking on the image name again and see if it pops? Because I see right now it's highlighted, but. Huh. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Sorry, people. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because nobody needs to look at that. <laughs> what I'm trying to show you is the 10 properties who have that have RCP'd for our event. Um, let me do this. Uh, there, managed to take things out here um, so that people will know um, if they want to come next week, which properties they would get to see. Um, I'm going to reopen them for y'all and then reshare. Um, and as I said, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that you might be able to see, but 
or that might that is available in the area, but it is what we will be showing people. I'm still being super weird. What is happening on my screen? Okay, I think this might work this time. There we go. Kim, can you see my map? I can see your map. Great. Okay. Um, so what you're seeing here is the same map Kim showed you already. Um, the er eligible area is the black line um, that surrounds the district. And then the red dots are the properties that will be participating in our open house tour um, next week again. Um, you can have a, a, a project in any of the buildings within this black boundary. Um, these are simply the ones that have available property where there will be real estate representatives um, at the property um, on the date and they will be able to show it. And I actually, I should correct myself. You can have uh, projects on any building in the, in the area with the exception of those buildings that are already receiving um, city incentives to do um, larger projects. I believe there are five other projects going on where the city is investing a large amount of tax increment financing and uh, potentially other funding to, um, to rehab the entire building. And in those cases, we have, as Sylvia or Kim mentioned, um, we have to reduce our grant amount because of other city funding that's being invested there. So in those cases, we cannot give a SPIF grant. So those buildings are gonna be excluded, but those are only five out of the many buildings in that area. And um, so most of the other buildings there are gonna be eligible. And uh, as a reminder, the reception of open house portion, the walking tours between two and four, and between four and six is the actual reception. And that will be at the Rookery building, um, which is also has space available on the first floor uh, for somebody if they're interested. Right, and please um, go ahead and go to our website to register for that. Um, that's at city, um, I'm sorry, uh, chicago.gov slash LaSalle Street. Great. Um, again, I don't think. Okay, so somebody asked, are any of these properties selected for residential uh, conversion and how will this impact things? Well, that that is sort of what we just covered here is a lot of those buildings that are ineligible for SPIF, there is part of the money is going towards residential conversion, therefore are not eligible to participate in SPIF. So I think that answered that question. All right, Nora, do you have anything else or Sylvia, anything else you want to add at this point? No, I think we covered everything at this point. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks everyone, we hope to see you on June 7th. And if you have additional questions after you learn a little bit more about the program, feel free to join us for any of our sub uh, subsequent webinars. Thank you so much.